Today we're going to develop the theoretical discussion about the theory of inflation, the classical theory of inflation, into uh, empirical testing and comparison to other theories, including the Phillips curve and NARO. So it's useful to understand, to recall, that the question we're asking about inflation is a question which is very specific to the post-war period. As I pointed out last time, if you look at the price uh, level in the United States from 1774 to about 1939 uh, or 40, you see there's not much change in the price level. There's been some ups and downs, and these are in fact the long waves that Kondratiev talks about. But really beginning in the post-war period, uh, especially after World War II, which is here, you see that prices rise as they typically do in every war, by the way. This is World War I here. This is Civil War here. This is War, uh, war of 1812. This is the Revolutionary War. You can see inflation happens in wars, but afterwards it comes down. In this case, inflation hap rises in World War II, but it never comes down, and you get this fantastic price rise. And that is the question that we're, being, we're addressing today. What accounts for the totally changed relationship between underlying variables about growth and profitability and demand and prices? From this, uh, based on the discussion last time, I developed the basic outline of the classical theory of inflation. And this outline, this theory is actually quite familiar for most of its uh, elements. In fact, for all of its elements, but they appear in different places. For instance, the first one is that the growth rate of nominal output is a function of an increase in purchasing power. Small pp is new purchasing power per, uh, relative to GDP. Now, what's interesting is that that new purchasing power relative to GDP, the idea that nominal output responds to increase of purchasing power is also in Friedman. In the Friedman case, here instead of new purchasing power, you put new money. But that is in fact how Friedman's original argument was posed in terms of the effect of the growth rate of money on nominal output. Secondly, you could make the same argument for Keynes. In the Keynes case, the new purchasing power is actually new demand. Uh, and so the growth rate of out nominal output would be a function of the growth rate of demand or of new demand relative to GDP, which would come to the same thing. So you see that the argument itself that new purchasing power or new money uh, from Friedman's point of view creates nominal output is really one of the, the elementary uh, arguments in macroeconomics. Then, of course, the issue arises, why does that output nominal output change, how, how much of it is real output and how much is inflation. Since the growth rate of nominal output by definition is a growth rate of real output plus the inflation rate, that's simply because nominal output is real output times, uh, inflate, times a price level. So the growth rate of nominal output is a growth rate of real output plus the inflation rate. So we can explain one of those, then we have the other. And the obvious classical argument is, and that's the argument I developed last time, is that real output growth depends on the pull of purchasing power, on the net rate of incremental rate of profit, that's uh, the rate of return on investment minus the interest rate, and on the tightness of the economy. But in this case, the tightness of the economy is measured not by unemployment, or by the employment rate, not by the capacity utilization rate, but by the growth utilization rate, the rate of the actual growth rate to the maximum growth rate. And since the actual growth rate is I over K, it's the investment over capital stock, and the profit rate is P over K, where P is profit, the Ks drop out, and the uh, degree of growth utilization is the investment over profit or the investment share in profit. So that very simple substitution means you can see that this argument here is also in Keynes. Keynes' investment depends on the net profit rate. So uh, part of the 
growth rate of nominal output comes from the investment itself and the purchasing power created by investment, the aggregate demand created by investment. But the difference is that Keynes has here, where I have the growth utilization date rate, he has the employment rate. Okay? So again, the arguments are actually fairly familiar. The one difference is really the idea that the limit to growth of real output is not unemployment or employment, not the tightness of the labor market, but the tightness of growth utilization. Okay, any questions about this? Now, typically in the, uh, so if you have, obviously if you have this relationship and you have this, then from the identity that inflation is by definition the difference between nominal output growth and real output growth, you have a theory of inflation. And the theory of inflation will be that uh, the net effect uh, on purchasing power, uh, positive impact of purchasing power, a negative impact of the net rate of profit because it has a positive impact on, gross out, on, on the growth rate of real output, so it has a negative impact on inflation. That's simply a way of saying that profitability expands growth is able to, real output growth expand more rapidly, which means that a pull from purchasing power will have less of an effect on inflation and more, uh, will show up more in real output growth. And then here the uh, growth utilization rate, which since it is a negative effect on uh, real output growth, it has a positive effect on inflation. One further substitution is that this rate sigma is equivalent to the employment rate. But we want to compare it to the Phillips curve, which uses the unemployment rate. So all we need to do is substitute instead for sigma, one minus sigma, which then has a negative impact and it becomes uh, analogous to the unemployment rate. And that way we can compare empirically the shapes of the curves and so on, right? But that doesn't obviously is uh, nothing to change in the hypothesis, just a different way of expressing the hypothesis. And then a further restricted form of this hypothesis is if you take into account the fact that these two variables here, net profitability and growth utilization, turn out to be quite correlated empirically. And if that's the case, then you can substitute one for the other. And since the growth utilization rate is widely available and is a parallel of the employment rate, that the restricted hypothesis can be that inflation depends positively on the pull of new purchasing power created and negatively or positively on the resistance because uh, the uh, growth utilization rate has one effect, the restrictive hypothesis because, the, the, because these two are correlated. So the net effect here depends on the relation on the strength of that correlation. Okay? So this is a hypothesis, this is the form that I test, and this restricted hypothesis is tested by Alberto Hanfas, whom I cite in the book, who is a Brazilian who uh, did his dissertation here, and this is a dissertation chapter of his on inflation. He was my student. And it came from our, the dissertation seminar, which I ran for a long time, and I use slightly different notation and terminology there, so you'll see the tests that he makes has slightly different notation. So we're going to get to that. So any questions up to here? This is, in effect, the classical theory of inflation. At the end, I'm going to show how it compares straightforward to narrow. But you can sort of see how it compares here to Friedman and Keynes. A question which arises now is the relationship between the uh, growth utilization rate or the growth non-utilization rate, it's sort of the, uh, the slack in growth capacity, and the unemployment rate, which is the slack in the labor market. So what's the relationship between the two? Since the growth utilization rate, sigma, is a ratio of the rate of accumulation to the rate of profit, it's possible that a falling rate of profit will slow down growth 
but if it slows down uh, and therefore increase the unemployment rate. So imagine that something is happening, such as pumping up the economy, which is increasing the wage share, which is causing the profit share to fall, which is causing the profit rate to fall. If the profit rate is going to fall, then there will be a feedback on the growth rate of real output. Here, if the net profit rate falls, then the growth output, real uh, output growth will fall. And that ha if that happens, then the unemployment rate will rise, other things being equal. If the unemployment rate rises, uh, so here you have the possibility that a falling rate of profit may increase unemployment. But if the growth rate falls by less than the profit rate, so that the effect of this variable on, uh, I'm sorry, this variable on the real growth rate is such that as this falls, this falls by less because there are other factors perhaps pumping it up, including effective demand being generated by the state and uh, by war spending or whatever, then the relationship between uh, the growth rate of real output, which is related to the growth rate of capital, and the profit rate might, will be such that the uh, profit rate falls. The growth rate will not fall by the same amount, but may fall less, so the gap between the two will narrow. So we expect that as a natural consequence of a falling profit rate, which causes unemployment to rise, and the state pumping it up to make unemployment come down, would narrow the difference between the maximum growth rate and the actual growth rate of capital, and that would make the economy tighter, even though unemployment is rising. So in the labor market, the uh, uh, economy is looser, and yet in terms of growth potential, it's tighter, and the consequence would be then inflation. Inflation with the unemployment rate coming back because the growth rate uh, is slowing down and so unemployment come back. So you stimulate the growth rate again, you narrow the gap again, and in the process you make the rate of profit fall even faster because wage share is rising as the economy gets tighter from the labor market point of view. And that causes, uh, a, that implies a classic, uh, a, a typical pattern of overstimulation stimulation beyond the limits of the system, which is falling profitability, rising unemployment, and rising inflation. And that is exactly what you observe in the era of the 70s and 80s, the era in which Keynesian theory was overthrown because it could not explain this pattern. And this is where Friedman steps in and says, ah, this is really due to the fact that you have a fixed unemployment rate, which is a voluntary unemployment, what he calls a natural rate, people choosing not to work because they have welfare and unemployment benefits and so on. And so the state mistakes this as involuntary unemployment. It pumps it, the economy up, lowers that rate for a while, but that rate comes back. And so you get uh, inflation expectations rising and inflation rises in response and you get the typical Friedman uh, explanation of uh, accelerating inflation, the narrow argument which I'm going to come back to. But you notice here, I don't need that. I don't need expectations. I just need the movement of the ob uh, observable movements in which in you have the profit rate and the growth utilization rate. Is that if you look at these variables here, the net profit rate has a uh, certain domain. It's the profit rate minus the interest rate. Now, you know, even if the interest rate is driven down to zero, the profit rate is on the order of 10, 12 percent, 6 percent, so it's a, a small variable. The difference between the two is even smaller. And it cannot vary a whole lot. The growth utilization rate could in principle be between 0 and 1. If there's no growth, then the growth utilization rate is 0. If the growth rate is equal to the maximum, it's 1. But it's going to be somewhere in between, and it's going to be limited in its range but there is no limit whatsoever on the purchasing power, new purchasing power creation, because under fiat money, the state can print any amount of money. Not without consequences, but technically it can print any amount of money. For example, during the Hungarian inflation from 1944 to 46, just three years now, uh, from 1944 to 1945, the note circulation increased by 3,000 times. 
just in that one interval. From 1945 to 1946, it increased by, I have to count this, thousand, hundred thousand, million, three billion times in one year. So when we think about money supply growth, we say, well, okay, 3%, 5%, but in this one year of 1944 to 1945, it was 3,000 times, and uh, then 3 billion times in the year after. So at the end of two years, it took 100 quintillion units of Hungarian currency, pengos, to acquire one pound of sterling. Okay? Now that already is an important clue. You can see that if these variables can't change very much, then the increase of the money supply, uh, increase of new purchasing power effect on inflation depends on whether this is small. If this is small, then these two will have a big impact. In fact, if this is zero, then it's entirely driven by these two. If, however, the new money creation gets bigger, then you can see it's going to have more of an impact relative to these two, and if it gets very big, it's going to completely swamp the other two. So you expect a nonlinear relationship between the creation of new money purchasing power and uh, inflation. Everybody with me here? That's just a natural consequence. It's exactly the same argument I made before in the chapter of the book on, in, on uh, exchange rates, where I made the point that the relationship between inflation and exchange rate is uh, dependent on other variables, which grow very slowly. So if inflation is small, then the exchange rate will largely respond to the uh, real costs, uh, relative real costs. But if inflation gets bigger and bigger, it's going to swamp that relationship. And so the exchange rate is going to depreciate in proportion to inflation at high levels of inflation. But at low levels, you will not find a relationship. In other words, purchasing power parity hypothesis will not work when inflation rates are low but will appear to work when inflation rates are high. Again, this is a typical nonlinearity that comes about when you have a nominal variable in one side and you have real variables, which are limited range on the other side. So now we're going to look at some investigation of hypotheses. So what's the first hypothesis here? First hypothesis is that the growth of nominal output is a function of, not equal to, because there are other factors involved in how nominal output responds to new purchasing power because the inventory change, backlogs, and all of that, but a function. And so we calculate, I calculate in the book, the new purchasing power, which by the way is available from the IMF data, International Financial Statistics. You can use that data to calculate this. And so the first question is, is there a relationship between so is there a relationship between the growth rate of nominal output, which is hypothesis one, and new purchasing power, relative new purchasing power? And you can see that it is a pretty good relationship over the whole post-war period, 1950 to 2010. I, I start in 1950 because IMF doesn't have data before that for, this, for these variables. Okay? So at first hypothesis, there is a good relationship between these two, in fact, a remarkably good relationship between these two variables, as could be expected from Keynes also. And if you count this as a measure of endogenous creation of money, it's also expected from Friedman. This new credit, uh, bank credit can be counted as endogenous creation of money. This new purchasing power is the sum of new bank credit and new uh, a domestic, uh, private bank credit and public credit. So it's the sum of the two creations of new purchasing power plus uh, purchasing power coming from abroad as measured by the current account. A surplus means that uh, it's coming from abroad. A deficit means that it's going abroad. So you have to add the current account uh, to the measure. Any questions here? Another way to look at that is as a scatter diagram. So it's the same variables as a scatter diagram. And you can see that it's a very nice scatter diagram, except for two variables, 1951 and 1952 periods, 1951, 1952, which is the
Korean War, and as I mentioned last time, uh, one might consider why in the Korean War uh, nominal uh, GDP was so different from purchasing power. And one possibility is something happening to GDP, but another possibility is we're not measuring purchasing power very well in those war years. Something else was going on that is not picked up in the IMF data. Uh, and I don't know the answer to that, by the way. Uh, so it would be interesting to see. So now the second key hypothesis, if you recall. So this I would argue, anyway, let me back up. This I would argue provides empirical support for the first hypothesis, which is this one here. And now we want to consider whether the growth rate of real output, how it relates to purchasing power, profitability, and the tightness of growth. Oh, I left out one thing here. You can do, of course, a regression on nominal GDP growth and relative purchasing power. Uh, it's a pretty good regression. I didn't try to do anything very clever with it. I have two dummies for uh, Vietnam War, a dummy for uh, the uh, second oil shock, and then, of course, for the crisis that takes uh, when a crisis breaks out in 2008. And I'm sure there are better ways to do this. But anyway, just to show you that you can get what you see visually a pretty good fit in the relationship between these two. So now we're interested in what's the relationship between um, real output growth and three variables, net profitability, purchasing power, and uh, growth utilization rate. So I have to can look at them one at a time. But here you can see pretty clearly there's a very nice relationship between real output growth and the net return on new capital, the net incremental rate of profit, which I develop in the book and measure and so on. And the one exception, again, here is this, which is 2009, which is a couple of years after the, or a year after the outbreak of the crisis. So now they come to the third hypothesis. Let me remind you what the third hypothesis is, or the, the, the derived hypothesis. The derived hypothesis is that uh, I have a relationship, therefore, given the first two relationships, an implicit relationship between inflation, purchasing power, net output, uh, net profitability, and either the growth utilization rate or the uh, slack in the growth utilization rate in this form. And this is the form I'm going to use because it gives you a relationship that has the same slope as a Phillips curve. Uh, and you can see, you can think of this, if this is the primary variable, then these other two will appear as shift factors. Uh, if this is the primary variable, then those first and third will appear shift factors and so on. And I'm going to come back to that. So I want to just look at it empirically because I want to make a comparison between the classical hypothesis and the Phillips curve. So if you think of the, the relationship between inflation and the, the slack in the growth utilization rate, then it has a Phillips curve kind of look. And the other variables will appear shift factors. So let's just start by looking at that relationship first. Here is 1 minus sigma, this, again, Translating from my screen to a max screen, variables disappear. So this is what shows up as 1 minus s here is actually 1 minus sigma, the growth utilization rate. And this is the uh, inflation rate. And you can see, allowing for certain years, this is the oil shock here. And this is world, uh, the Vietnam uh, Korean War. But other than that, you get a remarkably good relationship, ignoring all uh, the other two variables, which is profitability and uh, purchasing power. So you have uh, what looks like a, a Phillips curve between inflation and some kind of measure of the uh, slack. But it's not the slack in the labor market. It's a slack in growth utilization. Now notice, if I compare the same relationship, and I need to make this a little smaller so I can see both. Now notice the difference between the classical relation here and the 
conventional Phillips curve. If you take the whole data for the post-war, whole post-war period, 48 to 2010, uh, the classical relation is quite good and quite strong. There are some points here which I'm going to come back to, but you can see the upward sloping one. And the Phillips curve just doesn't exist. In fact, the fact that the Phillips curve is kind of a uh, a kind of target relationship of a bad shooter. You can see that it's all over the place, and if anything, it has a wrong slope. And that's precisely why the Phillips curve fell apart. When you expanded the Phillips curve to include data after 1980, basically, uh, even after the late 70s, the new points didn't fit on the original curve, and they kept getting more and more out of the way, and people were desperately trying to make some story of inflation expectations out of all of this to accommodate it. But I would argue that that was the wrong quest because the theory itself was wrong. And it is, in fact, perfectly consistent with the classical argument uh, that the key variable is not the unemployment rate, but rather the slack in the growth utilization rate. Now I take the same data, which is for the whole period, and I split it into two parts for the first part of the period and the second part of the period, and then you'll, and I do the same thing for the Phillips curve to see how that looks. So this is the first period, 1948 to 81. I'm taking the whole post-war period and splitting into two parts. This is the first part, and you can see that I've, I've drawn a 45-degree line here. So this is uh, uh, through, is this really 45 degrees? Anyway, it's a line through the intercepts here of this shape curve uh, of the, of the um, chart. And you can see that the first, in the first period, all the inflation rates lie above this line. There's not a fitted line. It's just a reference line. They lie above. And the Phillips curve, you can see in this same time period, because here you have the unemployment rate rather than the uh, slack in the growth utilization rate uh, is exactly wrong. First of all, there's no slope. And secondly, if there is one, it's not really a slope. Your eye sort of looks like it is. If you take out this, that point there, then you can see quickly that you don't really have much of a slope. And these scatter points don't add anything to it. A regression makes that very clear. So you have no relationship in the Phillips curve. And you have a very good one for the classical curve in that first period. In the second period, which is 1982 to 2010, you have still a fairly good relationship between the classical and conventional Phillips curve. And notice that the classical curve has two other variables I'm leaving out here. So we're going to get back to what happens when you put those variables in. But still, you get a reasonably good relationship here. Uh, and you get exactly the wrong relationship for the Phillips curve because it sloped in the wrong direction, um, which is exactly why people gave up on the Phillips curve. OK? So any questions here? We're moving towards the putting the whole story together. I, I always like to see the data first, because after all, you're hypothesizing about the actual variables, so you should at least have to take a look at them before you hypothesize. If we compare these two curves that I just looked at, the two periods that I just looked at, the first one from 1948 to 81, and the second um, from 1982 to 2010, is that in the first one, the, all the lines are above the 45 degree line. And here in the second one, most of them are below this 45 degree line, or at least this uh, line connecting the, in, in the edges of the graph. So the question is, what could account for, in the first instance, there being up here, and the second instance being down there? And the answer, of course, we know there's other variables in this story. And the other two variables are the net profit rate and purchasing power. So we go back up. So we look at this, the same problem from another point of view. Here's the inf inflation rate normal on a scale normalized and the growth utilization rate. And you can see that in the first period, 
except for this period which is right exactly the, the Korean War, and that may be why all these points fall off here, you have a very high spike in inflation in the Korean War, uh, and not due to tightness of the economy, but something else, uh, at least not to this measure of the tightness, but otherwise you get a pretty good fit, pretty good correlation, and then in the second half you also get a good correlation, except now the inflation rate is lower than it would be if other things were unchanged. So something is causing the inflation rate to be lower in the second part relative to what it would be if the variables were the same as in the first part. And we know that there are two variables that we have left out here. One is purchasing power and the other is profitability. So we can look at those two variables because we know that inflation, if you write this in a linear form, is a function of profitability, a purchasing power, net profitability, and this uh, slack in growth utilization rate. So I've just rewritten that same relationship calling sigma prime equal to one minus sigma. And so you can see from that point of view, these variables are shift factors, can be thought of as shift factors. So if the net effect of these two would be to lower inflation, these two were to move in the right way. For instance, this would have to move down and this would have to move up to make the inflation effect smaller. Uh, in the second period relative to the first. And so we've already seen that purchasing power has a particular relationship to net output. We saw that in the beginning. So we need to look here at the second variable, which is the net incremental rate of profit. And this is the HP trend of it. And you can see in the first part it is declining and the second part is rising. So here, if it's declining, it's going to be falling and that's going to give a uh, negative, uh, what, no wait, you would have less of a negative impact on inflation. Uh, I seem to have not printed out something, so I should have brought the book with me, let's see. We know that in the first period here, we saw earlier that uh, new purchasing power rises so this part is rising, which is going to strengthen inflation. Uh, and the uh, incremental rate of profit, we can see from this diagram, is falling. So that's going to also strengthen inflation. So we have a stronger relationship in the first part. Uh, and in the second part, we saw purchasing power uh, is falling relative to uh, what it was before. You can see it's coming down here. And on the other hand, the incremental rate of profit is rising. So both of those effects are going to weaken inflation. So from this point of view, we'd expect the scatter diagram that we got to be in the form that it is. The first part would be higher than the second part for any given rate of uh, uh, sigma prime of uh, excess of uh, slack in the utilization rate. In other words, this is exactly what we'd expect if you treat these as shift factors, that the first curve would be higher than the second. But both would be, in fact, shaped the same way. And that suggests really the proper way to do this is to do a regression with all three variables, and then you can see the respective effects of these and so on. But I, I like to look at the empirical evidence precisely because when you do that, you see these structural breaks which you might not otherwise see. And that means when you're doing a regression, you, have so, you should have some sense of where there is a, a break point in the, in the data. So, so far, the first hypothesis holds up pretty well. And the growth rate of, of uh, nominal output is very well correlated with the uh, increase of new purchasing power. The second hypothesis uh, we're going to come to in a further testing, but it gives you something like a classical equivalent of the Phillips curve, whereas the, the traditional Phillips curve doesn't work. This works very well, and moreover, the shift in the level of the curve can be explained by the movements of the other two variables, which is net profitability and purchasing power. So then, uh, Alberto Hanfas, uh, in his dissertation, 
took on this question. Now, at the time when I was working on this, I, I ran a seminar on inflation for, I don't know, five, seven years in order to get a feel for these things. And uh, at that point, I was calling this term sigma the throughput ratio, uh, explaining sort of in, that in, in the engineering sense how difficult it was to go push more through the pipe. The higher the throughput ratio, uh, the throughput ratio is actually 1 minus sigma. But anyway, think of it as pushing things through a pipe. The more full the pipe is, the harder it is to push more things through. So that it kind of a resistance to further uh, increases in, in growth, in real growth. And what he tested was uh, a form of the hypothesis. Oh my god, what is this? Oh well. I have no idea. I checked this just before I came, so obviously the ghost of Steve Jobs is here. Anyway, this is table 15.2, and you can look at it in the book. Uh, I'll try and it, it shows up fine on my PowerPoint on the Windows machine, so it should be OK for display, hopefully. Uh, but the hypothesis being tested is the inflation rate in period t is a function of uh, purchasing power times a function of uh, uh, the um, variable sigma, which is the growth utilization rate. And Hanfoss makes the point that intuitively you expect the effect of purchasing power to be different when the economy is loose and when it's tight. And that's a typical Keynesian type of argument, too. If the economy is loose, most of the increase of new purchasing power will go into uh, real output. So it will not go into inflation. In the other hand, if the economy is tight, then most of it will go inflation and not into real output. And this is a Keynesian argument, too. If you have a lot of unemployment, then most of the increase of purchasing power will go into increasing employment and not much into inflation. Only here, the key variable is not unemployment, but the growth utilization rate. So he proposes a nonlinear relation here uh, so that the effect can be small in one way, and then as sigma gets bigger, it can become increasingly uh, inflationary. And there's absolutely sensible and, and uh, that we should think of this as nonlinear. The form of the nonlinearity is something that one can play with. Now, um, again, I can't show you the thing, but that is on page 15. Hanfas does it for a larger number of countries, for 10 countries. Um, I'm going to read you the names of those countries, which are in here someplace. I took that out of my thing to save some space. Well, uh, just let me read it from the table itself. US, France, um, UK, Canada, South Korea, Japan, Germany, Brazil, Mexico, and South Africa. Those are the countries for which he collected the data from the IMF for the purchasing power, collected the data for the growth utilization rate. We couldn't collect data for the, non, for the net profit rate, but in any case, that uh, is correlated with the growth utilization rate. And he found that he got very good results for most countries. Um, um, and found that the predictive value of the uh, inflation shows good correspondence to the actual values. The fits were uh, generally good. The shape uh, or the function had the expected signs, which suggests a kind of U-shaped functional form for this function f here. Um, and just as a test, he substituted for sigma the Keynesian measure of unemployment, which would be the equivalent of unemployment, and even some people have used capacity utilization or excess capacity utilization. But here, this would be the employment rate if you use sigma. 
and uh, or the capacity utilization rate using the same form and found out that it was not a good fit. So that it isn't just a question of the form, it's the question of the variable itself. So that gives us some confidence that on a world, uh, on a world scale, the data, the hypothesis is fairly robust. I'm afraid now to look at my next thing, but it's not a table. It's okay. It seems to be bad on tables, but okay on charts. Okay. So the next two hypotheses, uh, next two pieces of data, are data which were available, one of them was available already. And that was a study by Harberger in 1988. Now notice I argued earlier that the relationship between inflation and the uh, purchasing power uh, depends on whether the economy is loose or tight. And when purchasing power is low, then profitability and the tightness of the economy will be the major factors determining inflation. But as purchasing power gets bigger and bigger, the other two variables being limited in their range, the purchasing power will have more and more an effect. And if it's high enough, it'll be essentially close to one to one with inflation. So that's a natural expectation coming from the uh, fact that purchasing power has no limit in fiat money, whereas the other two variables have very narrow ranges, right? So here is uh, Harberger's data. Here he measures the growth of domestic credit, which is private and public credit. So it's very close to my purchasing power measure, except he's using the growth rate, and I use it as uh, the change in this variable over output. But they are highly correlated, so it doesn't really matter. And here he has inflation. Now, what he does is he takes a whole bunch of countries. Uh, each of these data points represents a different country averaged over 1970 to 1988. And the countries are uh, quite a few. So I think I have it in the book, the list of these countries uh, on page. Shows you why I should bring the book with me. 29 countries from ranging from Argentina to Tunisia. Uh, and they are listed, I think, in the appendix. Oh, here, OK. Uh, no, that's the, that's the second one. So um, and what he found, what I noticed he found, he doesn't have this graph. He acts as a table. But immediately when I saw the table, I saw a nonlinear relationship, which was exactly what used to be expected. And you, if, so I, I plotted the data that he has in the table. And when you plot it, you see something quite striking. If I look below the range here, this is a range from 0 to 20%, you can see that there's really no relationship between increase of purchasing power, domestic credit, and inflation. Everybody see that here? If I stick to this square, which is uh, below 10% to this range, then you see that there's no relationship. If I go 20 to 40, which are his ranges, by the way, not mine, so I'm sticking to his ranges, then you see a relationship beginning to emerge. And when the growth rate of domestic credit is in the range of uh, above uh, high, uh, is very high, uh, you get inflation, which is also very high, and you see the strong correlation between the two. Now again, since no economy can grow in real terms more than 6, 7, 8% for any length of time, if you're going to increase purchasing power by 100% uh, or 1,000%, you're going to get mostly inflation. Okay. And this, by the way, eliminates also the standard post-Keynesian notion that somehow inflation comes out of workers raising their wages and firms creating mock-ups and all that. It's very hard to make the argument that uh, these inflation rates have come from workers raising the wages, nominal wages. You do observe workers trying to catch up desperately. 
but we know lots of instances like the Hungarian case where the money supply has increased 3,000% in one year and then 3 billion percent in the next year. And there's no way to explain that from workers suddenly demanding a 3 billion percent increase in monetary wage. It would be a joke. Okay? So uh, I always loved this graph, but I couldn't find anyone to extend it until uh, uh, Ramamurthy, uh, another dissertation student. This is a chapter from her dissertation. And she did it for uh, 24 countries, taking, again, IMF data. This is all publicly available data. And you can see, again, the same relationship. I, I, the actual bands should be different, but in order to keep everything comparable, I kept all the scale the same and the dividing points the same, though this graph, the dividing points would be down here, and then another set uh, up to here, perhaps, and then one higher up. But anyway, I kept them the same. And you can see, basically, no relationship when the growth of domestic credit is low, inflation is low, but there's really no scatter between the two. As the growth of domestic credit gets higher, inflation is sort of uh, higher in level, but there's still no strong relationships. You get this kind of curve. But then, as the growth of domestic credit goes above 100%, or in the 80%, let's say, this is, this is a log scale, so this is maybe 80% or so, then you get a relationship that begins to emerge pretty clearly. Okay. So that gives us some confidence that this uh, uh, hypothesis works. The nonlinearity is inherent in the hypothesis, and it's good, uh, can be uh, confirmed from these uh, samples of a lot of countries. So it's not just a particular moment of time. And part of, it's basically all the, the countries for which we could get the data. OK? We made no effort, for instance, to throw out countries on any grounds whatsoever. So the point, again, here is that I'm trying very hard to show that there's a simple hypothesis that can explain the other hypotheses without any additional explanation. Right? And again, the simple hypothesis is derived from the other hypothesis so that it's not added on. It's a necessary part of the emphasis of profitability driving growth and demand driving nominal output. Any other questions? OK, so now we're going to come to <laughs> Argentina. And again, I, I did it for Argentina because I happen to have the data given to me by an Argentine student who was in the government at the time but is not anymore. Um, and so I had access to the data. In the original story, Argentina in Harberger's uh, original, let me go back a little bit. In this original graph uh, of, uh, of Harberger's data, the, as I said, the graph is not from Harberger, but I used his data to create the graph. Argentina appears in the 1980s up here somewhere. It's one of these. Because in the 1981-1982 period, uh, it has a uh, average inflation rate of 235, so it's going to be somewhere around here. And uh, growth of domestic credit of about uh, 312, 255 and 312. Strong, close correlation between these two. Okay, So it's one of these points here. It might even be, let's see, this is 200. So it's got to be this point right here, I think. Yeah, 255. So it's one of the top two points. But now we want, I want to look at Argentina itself over time, because this hypothesis is also applicable to over time. And, and I didn't have data on profitability for Argentina. Nothing much I can do about that, because it wasn't available. But I, uh, I had data on only GDP growth and the growth of domestic claims, which is basically new purchasing power. right? But here you can see, beginning in 1961, there's a relationship between new purchasing power and nominal GDP growth. Uh, many post-Keynesians would say, well, nominal GDP growth comes entirely because it's endogenous from the demand for new credit. And there's some truth to that. But the fact is that this jump in nominal GDP growth 
I'm sorry, in, in uh, new purchasing power doesn't come from a demand, it comes from the state increasing the supply of domestic credit through public credit. So even though there's an endogenous element to that, there's also a driving element, which is the state. And here you can see what happens when the state in 1989 to 1991 or, uh, or two, you can see this huge rise and then the quick collapse also. So that's already another uh, reflection of this nonlinearity issue. If you drive the new purchasing power, largely through something like uh, state-created domestic credit or it's increase in money supply, similar to that, you're going to get, if you get high rates, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 5,500 increases of the uh, uh, domestic uh, creation of purchasing power, you're going to get an increase of inflation. Okay. Now, I didn't have data here for foreign uh, money, uh, current accounts, because I couldn't get that data. And notice that this, this is nominal GDP growth here. I said it wrong. I was looking at this graph here. This is nominal GDP growth and growth in domestic credit. And you can see here uh, that this big jump in domestic credit, which comes from the state expenditures, cr state creation of printing power, uh, purchasing power, drives nominal GDP growth. But this graph here is uh, the same variable here, growth of domestic claims on the horizontal axis. But on the vertical axis, you get, uh, no, I'm sorry. On the dotted line, it's the same variable. The solid line is now inflation. And so you see something quite interesting. Uh, the nominal growth in purchasing power creates a nominal growth in output, but not as much. And one reason is, of course, that money goes not just into uh, buying goods and services, it also goes into financial assets. So this part here is not just going into actual um, um, goods and services and their prices, but land and stocks and all that. And it is also going abroad. Because, as you'll see in a minute, when you have this big jump in domestic credit, you also have a great depreciation of the exchange rate and a lot of money flows out. So we'd expect this, the real GD, uh, the nominal GDP to grow much more slowly at the peak or grow less, not more slowly, but grow less than the domestic claims created. For that same reason, uh, inflation is less because some of the money is going into assets rather than into commodities and services. Here we have a lovely relationship between the rate of depreciation of the exchange rate and the inflation rate. This is the rate of depreciation of the exchange rate, that's a dark line, and the inflation rate, which is the uh, dotted line. And in the, when the, these are low, there's really not much relation to, to the two, which is why purchasing power hypothesis doesn't work. A purchasing power parity hypothesis doesn't work. As the rates become higher, like 500%, you see much more relationship. And at the fantastic rates of 5,000 or 4,500 percent of inflation, you get, uh, uh, I'm sorry, of 3,000% uh, inflation, you get the depreciation rate is even higher. And that's because the outflow of money is also damaging the currency, not just inflation. And we, we know that empirically, of course. We know that when you have high inflation, people take their money out of the local currency and go, so the currency depreciates. And here, depreciation is shown as an increase of the way I measure the currency. It's the amount of uh, uh, Aust um, Argentine currency that you need for a dollar. And so it's, when that rises, this is a depreciation. OK, any questions up to here? What I've tried to show you is that they've already existing many bits of data which were known but not understood the same way. And it's possible to show that they are perfectly consistent with the argument. And the Phillips curve is not. Phillips curve falls apart and disappears. So this is not a monetarist argument, but you can see the monetarist element of it, which is if the state pumps up the public credit then after a certain point you can get inflation, not be, and yet you can have unemployment at the same time, which is very important because that's 
the opposite of the monetarist argument, which always is based on full employment. It also is the opposite of the Keynesian argument, because Keynesian argument says that you need to get uh, the reserve army eliminated before you can get inflation. But here you can see that you can have a growing reserve army and inflation at the same time. If the profit rate is falling and the growth rate doesn't fall as much, the gap is tighter and you're pumping up the economy, you're going to get inflation and yet you're going to get unemployment rising. And I argue that's what happens in the 1980s uh, in the United States and probably every country. We looked at other countries also, but that'd be a good paper topic to look at uh, the other countries in that great period where the debate between the Keynesians and the anti-Keynesians took place and the Keynesians lost and were effectively uh, dethroned theoretically. So now that brings me to back to the original issue which is the relationship between this argument which I'm calling the classical argument and the narrow story of inflation based on expectations uh, causing inflation to rise and therefore ultimately leading possibly to accelerating inflation. So let me summarize the argument itself, uh, the classical argument itself. First point, nominal GDP is driven by relative, new relative purchasing power, which is the main source of new demand, and that's that relationship 15.3, which is G sub Y is a function of PP, which is relative new purchasing power. Okay? Second relationship is that real output growth is dependent on purchasing power, profitability, and the tightness of the growth potential of the economy. Again, all of these are derived from pretty much from classical arguments about the limits to growth and the, uh, the, the uh, incentive to grow, which is profitability and so on. And combining these two gives you an equation for inflation, since the difference between the first and the second is the inflation rate. So you have an implicit theory of inflation, positively related to purchasing power, negatively related to profitability, because higher the profitability, more uh, uh, pull will go into real growth rather than inflation, and positively related to the growth tightness, because the tighter the economy, the more the pull on it through demand will go into inflation rather than into real growth. Now, one way to to compare it to the Nehru is to write these general relationships, which are at this state unspecified uh, in the sense that their functional relationship uh, is Hanfas's way to specify this relationship uh, in a nonlinear form. But I want to compare here to the Nehru. And since the Nehru is typically written in the simplest way in a linear form, I want to show you the simplest linear equation equivalent of this so we can compare the two on the same terms. So I can take this relationship here, which is the inflation hypothesis in the classical, the general hypothesis, and break it into two parts. One where there's a, a component which depends on net profitability and purchasing power, and the second a component which depends on the tightness of the economy. And this term here, you can write this beta times sigma c prime is just a constant. So beta times sigma c prime is just the intercept term. You can always take an intercept and rewrite it so that it's beta times some number and then you can see that what that means is that basically when the uh, growth utilization rate is below that number, so you notice here this is inflation will be dependent on uh, beta times some deviation between the growth utilization rate and the, um, you know, I should have written it. This I think is something I should have done differently in the book, which is to write this as one, oh no, I'm sorry. I forgot my own notation. Uh, sigma prime is the equivalent of the unemployment rate. It's one minus sigma. So this is the, no, the signs are correct. Sigma prime is one minus sigma and beta sigma prime is just the uh, constant, just the intercept term. So this says that in effect when you have more slack in the economy you'll have less inflation. Okay? 
which is equivalent to saying in the in narrow hypothesis, when you have more unemployment, you'll have less inflation. So the, the arguments are parallel. It's a variable that's different. And so now that brings us to uh, the narrow hypothesis. The narrow hypothesis, uh, narrow stands for non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. Uh, which is basically the hypothesis that it's only at that unemployment rate that inflation will be stable. If you try to lower the unemployment rate, then you'll get inflation rising, and if you try to maintain it, inflation will be accelerating. So it's a non-accelerating rate, inflation rate of unemployment. And it comes from the Friedman Phelps argument of, that inflation expectations drive actual inflation. The simplest form of this hypothesis is uh, that inflation depends on past inflation and a term which depends on the relationship between some uh, critical value of unemployment and the actual level of unemployment. Now, you've written it this way. You can see the parallel here. This is past inflation, whereas this is a term which is based on other variables. And these parts look very similar, except here that you have the slack in growth utilization, and here you have the slack in the labor market. If you look at it that, from that point of view, uh, and there are many tests of Nehru, so I don't go through them here because they're pretty well known, you notice certain similarities between these two hypotheses. Uh, both depend on the extent to which the slack in the economy is uh, greater than some critical value. So if the unemployment rate is too big, then inflation will have uh, be reduced. Will uh, here, both of them depend on the fact that inflation is linked to departures from critical some critical value of the key variable, sigma or UL in a similar form. Other things being equal, I'm here giving us linear specification because the narrow form I'm picking is linear, but Nehru also has nonlinear specifications, and we've already seen that you can make a nonlinear specification of that. A second similarity is that in the classical argument, though it's not in this part of the story, the classical argument implies that there will be some return to a normal rate of unemployment. That was a discussion in chapter 14. If you saw, remember the, the wage share curve, and that curve had an intercept at some normal rate of unemployment. That rate of unemployment was, in fact, the system's response to pressure. If you have the reserve army shrinking too much, then labor is imported, and incentives are given for people who are not in the labor force to come in, and that increases the reserve army again. If the reserve army gets too big, then uh, labor is exported. People who are immigrants and so on are driven out or, or discouraged because this is on a growth path, and people who are in the labor force uh, end up leaving it again because they can't get work or they are persuaded to leave. For instance, typically in World War II, uh, since so many men were fighting the war, older people, younger people, and women, and black people were encouraged to go into the labor force. So this was an immigration, so to speak, but by changing the labor force participation rate, bringing them in from where they were outside. And then after the war, they were urged to get out again. So the difference is that in the classical argument, that normal rate of unemployment, which is in the early argument, is an involuntary rate. It's people looking for work that can't find jobs because the system reproduces a level of uh, normal unemployment. Whereas in the narrow argument, that normal rate, which is this one here, is in fact full employment because it is effectively the number of people who really are uh, un taking, uh, are pretending to be unemployed or claiming to be unemployed, but really choosing not to work because wages are too high in the union sector, so other people can't get jobs, or there's unemployment compensation and welfare payments, so they don't dis want to work. So there's a difference between these two uh, hypotheses in, in the broader context. And notice that. Um, in the classical perspective, 
which was the earlier one here, we had a wage curve, I'm sorry, a wage curve going this way, rate of change of, of uh, wage share, and the unemployment rate going that way, or the, that curve, which I showed, holds pretty much for the whole post-war period until 1980 when it gets smashed and moves down, represents the relationship between capital and labor under given social conditions. And those social conditions can be changed so that if the curve is shifted down, let's say this is the intersect, this is the horizontal axis, the curve comes here. But if you shift the curve down so it comes here, then it crosses at a lower unemployment rate. And so the, nat the normal rate of unemployment in the system can be lowered by reducing the strength of labor. And in fact, I would argue that's exactly what Reagan and Thatcher did. They did, in fact, lower the unemployment rate, and they did smash labor at the same time. In the classical argument, this growth utilization rate here is not necessarily an equilibrium rate, because even uh, if inflation was zero, these other variables would have to be add up to zero for to make that to be the rate. And there's nothing in here that suggests that inflation will be zero. Inflation will be what it is depending on these three variables. So it doesn't say that the inflation will come back to the level that will make the growth utilization rate equal to some uh, given other rate. There are limits to it, obviously, between zero and one. But where it is in between is contingent on these other factors. And we can see that. We looked at the, the chart of the movement of the growth utilization rate, and you can see that. Uh, let me, in fact, go back to that just to make that point a little bit clearer. This is the growth utilization rate in dotted lines, and the other is the inflation rate. But you can see that there is no uh, natural level of the uh, growth utilization rate. It's somewhere between 0 and uh, these are normalized, so you can't tell by the scale, between 0 and 1 in the absolute scale. But that's all you can say at this level. OK, so <clears throat> a third point here is that a point of difference between the classical and the Nehru hypothesis is that in the classical hypothesis, the inflation rate is determinate. It depends on what these variables are. Or if you want to put it up here better, depends on what sigma, net profit rate, in, uh, net uh, IROP, which is the incremental rate of profit, uh, net of interest, and purchasing power will give you a particular inflation rate. So there is no normal inflation rate. It depends on these variables. And if you have an inflation rate, then the price level is, in fact, uh, path dependent, because it depends on what's happened with inflation before. So there's no natural or normal level of the price once you have fiat money. If you have gold or commodity money, silver, salt, whatever, then you could argue that there's some level of the price dependent on the relationship between the, the price of production of the commodity and the price of production of the money commodity. So competition will establish some normal level of the price. And we saw that that was pretty much up and down in the uh, the normal level of price was pretty much up and down until we hit fiat money in the modern form. And then suddenly you get a price level which has no um, normal level. It is path dependent. And again, this follows straightforward from the logic of the argument. If you have growth rates, then the level is path dependent because it depends on what happened to the growth rate. And even depends even on the shocks. I made that point that the path will depend on the shocks. And so even if you have a fixed growth rate, the shocks will determine the path. And that's a well-known problem we talked about before. Okay? So a lot of things can be explained from this very simple framework. Notice that in the narrow hypothesis, however, the growth rate is not determined. What is determined is the rate of change of the growth rate, the acceleration rate of 
inflation. So instead of having a particular inflation rate that determined, which would mean the path of prices would be, uh, the, the level of prices would be path dependent, you have, in the narrow hypothesis, you have that the inflation rate is path dependent because this is the inflation rate and this is the lagged inflation rate. So if you take this over to this side, you have the change in the inflation rate. And that's what's being determined here. If the change of the inflation rate is zero, that doesn't tell you the level of the inflation rate. In other words, in the narrow hypothesis, the inflation rate is path dependent. Whereas in the classical hypothesis, the inflation rate is determinate, but the price level is path dependent. Uh, let's start here. If I take this pi t minus 1 over to this side, then I get delta pi t. So the narrow hypothesis in this simple form says delta pi t is dependent on the deviation of unemployment from the normal natural rate of unemployment. So in equilibrium, if these two are equal, which is the equilibrium hypothesis, then delta pi t is zero. But delta pi t zero doesn't tell you what pi t is. And different shocks will give you a different pi t, because this is a typical problem of, of uh, uh, unit roots. So delta pi t will be zero, will tell you that pi t depends on the shocks and the path. So the inflation rate is purely path dependent. Now go to the classical hypothesis. Suppose for some reason pi t is some number, which it, it will be if all the other variables are constant. So for given levels of the other variable, I'll have a particular inflation rate. But the inflation rate subject to shocks will mean that the price level will be path dependent. Because we know from if you have a, a given growth rate, which is the inflation rate, it's a growth rate of prices, it's a slope. But a shock can raise you to a new higher level of the same slope, it can bring you down to a new higher level of the same slope. So even if the inflation rate didn't change, the level of prices would be path dependent just from shocks. This is a unit root problem. And that's a big difference in the implications of, of the two hypotheses. Fourth, in the classical case, the proximate causes of inflation are declines in the growth rate relative to the profit rate, which could come about because the profit rate falls, uh, and or increases in the creation of new purchasing power, as in the saw in Argentina. If you're going to increase purchasing power by 3,000% in a year, then you're going to get inflation. Because there's no real growth of the economy that can correspond to 3,000% a year. So you're increasing demand by 3,000% a year. At least the demand in the commodity market will be increased by, say, 2,000% or something like that. Some of it will go into asset inflation. Then you're going to get inflation. And this is the old monetarist concern from observation, beginning with the colonists who settled the United States, who printed money and gave rise to enormous inflation never seen before in human history. Because it turned out that the state could print money, could buy anything it wanted, and the prices rose. It printed more money and bought them and so on. Pretty soon the currency was worth nothing, but the state was still able to stay uh, taking a big chunk uh, or taking a chunk of, of the actual real goods and services. This is, for instance, why in this book called Cappy, Cappy's book, which is um, World Inflations or something, I've forgotten the title, but anyway, it's C-A-P-I-E, a uh, very good book to have. Uh, Forrest Cappy, Major Inflations in World History, 1991. It's a very good book because it has lots of information about inflations and quickly dispels any claim, any notion that inflations come out of wage increases. You can see that when, like the Hungarian inflation, three billion increase in the uh, money supply in one year. So this, this idea of hyperinflation coming from, um, Cappy makes the point that the historical record of hyperinflation, which has happened in other places and times, not just in Hungary, but Germany, as we know, in the 1920s, Israel in the 1940s, uh, the U.S. colonies 
in the founding, uh, prior to the founding of the United States, the Chinese Revolution, the French Revolution, the Mexican Revolution, they typically are situations of turmoil where output is actually shrinking because of the turmoil. At the same time, for that reason, the state is funding more and more of its uh, needs by printing money so that you have the pull is getting bigger and bigger and the supply is actually shrinking. And the result has to be roughly inflation. So quoting Cappy, <coughs> hyperinflation seemed to rise from a combination of reckless government printing of money and a decline in output due to civil war and social unrest. That's page 10 of Cappy. Whereas in the narrow argument, hyperinflation comes from persistent attempts by the state to maintain unemployment below the natural rate. In other words, in the uh, narrow argument, hyperinflation comes because the unemployment rate is too low. There's too much employment. Whereas Cappy's point is that historically, inflation comes in times of mass unemployment because the economy is declining due to a war, people are unemployed, and the state is pumping up money. So that's a big difference uh, in those two. And that same difference shows up in uh, the classical argument versus narrow. Okay, lastly, the argument I've made so far, the classical argument, is consistent with all the other arguments in the book. That's very important because all these other arguments are derived from one basic principle, which is the role of profitability driving growth, driving investment. That's a key role, profitability net of interest. And that's the same argument Keynes makes, actually, and Joan Robinson makes about um, growth, about investment being driven by net profitability. Um, <clears throat> and all of these arguments are linked back to the theory of uh, real competition. So the argument I'm making does not rely in any way on monopoly power. It does rely on the possibility of something greatly expanding the money uh, uh, purchasing power which can come from private, but generally it has to be f funded by and supported by the state. And that's different from the narrow kind of argument and the Friedman kind of argument, all of which depend on the deviation from competition. Friedman says the unemployment rate, the natural rate of unemployment would be zero if there was perfect competition. It's because of the welfare state, because of unemployment insurance, it's because of unions that this uh, number here in the narrow hypothesis is not zero. This number here is not zero. If it was perfect competition, this would be zero and unemployment rate would be settled at zero and inflation would be stable. Okay. So from the narrow hypothesis point of view, and this is relevant to modern debates in Germany and Greece and so on, the best way to, to uh, have the system return to its growth potential and its competitiveness is to make sure that uh, the unemployment rate is zero and that will happen if you go back towards so-called competitive labor markets labor markets in which workers don't have any say and uh, attempt to influence wages. They respond only to the demand and supply for labor in such a way that they will accept whatever wage which will give employment to everybody on the assumption that there is such a wage. Right? So in the neoclassical story, it's pretty clear the wage is an endogenous variable that makes uh, full employment possible. And it follows from that thinking that unemployment is because of interference by the state and by labor, and that's a consistent argument. I've argued throughout that the classical argument is fundamentally different, both in terms of uh, how the labor market works, how unemployment comes about, how growth comes about, and now how inflation comes about. And the key point here for me is that uh, these are implications of the same consistent set of arguments throughout, from micro to macro. Okay. Any questions here? Um, yeah. Uh, 
would you say, uh, for example, that the uh, Polish Keynesians did the uh, uh, mistake of taking as the same thing the price of uh, uh, relative prices and the price level, because uh, the price is just the uh, markup and the wages, and that really is a, a relative price, and they take as if the price level went down because wages are going up, but actually what's it, what changing is the I think that's right. Uh, let me say one positive thing here first. The post Keynesians are basically making an argument which, if you look at uh, careful post Keynesians, say only applies to fiat money. So they are applying only to my, the curve when it goes up that way and not to an earlier period. And those ones who know history don't try to apply it there. So it has something to do in their idea that this new period comes from monopoly. The monopoly power then gives rise to fixed markups. Fixed markup means that the only active variable here, once the markups are fixed, is the wage rate. So from that point of view, you don't have any room left. You can have external shocks, like export prices and uh, import prices and all of that, oil shock. But basically, you can't explain it without saying that something is happening from labor, because it's the only variable left that has some say, so to speak, on its price. So that's logical once you make that step. But I think it's a mistake, as you said, because they conflate relative prices with the price level. But the positive aspect is they're trying to explain something which is new. And the monetarists say, well, that new thing is because of the state interfering in the uh, rate of growth of the money supply. So now both sides are explaining this part of the curve. Both sides are attempting to explain that part of the curve, and they're doing so in opposite ways. But it's this shaded area that both sides are trying to explain. Um, I think I've said this before, but <laughs> I was once an um, extra in a uh, TV show. Extra meaning that uh, I was working at the Levy Institute, and they were having a TV show by uh, a man named William Buckley, who was a very uh, well-known, extremely conservative, uh, uh, Republican who had his TV show called Firing Line and they did it at the Levy Institute so they could have a debate between the Levy Institute people who were Democratic Party and Bill Buckley who and some senators who were Republican and conservative but they didn't have enough people to show up in Levy Institute is pretty isolated so every, we were all required to come down put on our jackets and sit in the audience so somewhere in TV land, you, you may see my face there. You'll probably see my expression also. But what I was really struck by, struck by, here you had the people who saw themselves as progressives, which were the post-Keynesians, and uh, the Levy is very strong on post-Keynesian economics, Minsky, Godley, uh, Ray now, and others, uh, and, uh, Neil Kla and, and the conservatives, political conservatives. The senator from Buffalo, New York, was running for president at that time, and Bill Buckley was a strong conservative. And a debate arose about what causes inflation. And consistent to their theory, the post-Keynesians said it's caused by labor. And consistent to their theory, the conservatives said it's caused by the state. And at one point, the senator from Buffalo, who was a very strong right-wing guy, said, you know, this is really insulting. I'm from the working class, and you're saying that we cause inflation. And the people, you know, who are on the other side, who are uh, considered themselves liberals and supporters of labor, are going, but isn't, they saw the state as something they had to defend. They said, it's not by the state. So that was the way they made. And I thought, there's something missing here. Uh, it, to me, it, because I started reading about inflation, it's pretty clear it's not caused by labor. But it, neither is it just caused by state spending and money supply. So the question is, that led me to uh, create a seminar on inflation. One of the best ways you learn, uh, you'll learn to discover how, how to understand something is to teach it. Because then your ignorance is right up there. And over time, if you get to teach it more than once, you learn something. So the seminar on inflation led me to works by Cappy, Srafa, others, a long-term history. And then you have the question in front of you, which is this. How do we explain this? I don't see any way to explain this by rising monopoly power. I mean, that would be pretty extraordinary rise of monopoly power, and no measure comes even close to this kind of growth. So that throws that out. 
uh, state intervention, no, that's Friedman ultimately that tried to provide an answer for that, but the idea that people who were, who were uh, knocking on the door trying to get jobs were really pretending because they had all the jobs or because their fellow workers had raised wages too high didn't seem plausible and even many conservatives didn't accept that argument. Uh, so the question is where to go. And that led me to notice another thing which was very common in that same debate. So that for both of them, both sides, inflation took place when there was full employment. I mean, that's clear. Friedman says, you increase the money supply, it will not have an impact on prices unless nominal prices, nominal GDP, which will increase when you increase the money supply, uh, is limited, uh, unless real GDP is limited, so that the rest of that increase goes into prices. And when asked, what is that limit, he says, ah, I assume full employment. But then it's okay. You have full employment uh, as a normal circumstance. You increase the money supply, you get inflation. The Keynesians say, no, no, no. We have unemployment as a normal circumstance. So if you increase the money supply or effective demand, you will get uh, more employment until you hit full employment, then you get inflation. For both of them, inflation is a full employment phenomenon. So then the third, when I began to study these things, it was already, uh, this was all happening in the 1980s, Keynesian theory had already fallen apart because it could not explain the fact that unemployment was getting, employment was getting uh, smaller, so unemployment was getting bigger, not smaller, and inflation was getting higher, not less. So right away you could see that uh, there was a problem to be resolved. How can you explain higher inflation with higher unemployment? Friedman jumped in and said, it's not really higher unemployment, it's full employment. And then that saved the, the neoclassical argument. But the, to me that made no sense looking at it on the ground, seeing people who are unemployed. Um, so that led to the question of how uh, can you explain the rise in the unemployment rate? And at the same time, the rise of the inflation rate. And my earliest paper on inflation, which is about the 1980s, I, I plot the this exact graph, my first thought was, well, okay, the, uh, we need another theory of the limits to real GDP growth, because if nominal growth is pulled up by purchasing power, then what causes real GDP growth? And I had already written in my dissertation something which came back to become relevant. Um, which was that if you look in uh, Ricardo, the limit to growth of an economy in Ricardo is not employment of labor, but the degree to which you can put the surplus product back into. In Ricardo's corn-corn model, you have corn input, corn for labor, and a corn surplus. That surplus can be used to expand the corn input and employment of labor, and the rest of it consumed by the capitalists, the more you use it to expand, the faster the growth rate. So the limit is when all of the surplus goes back to uh, people involved in production, which could be the capitalist as you know, uh, uh, people working in the production process or supervising it or whatever. So the maximum growth rate is when the profit, when the surplus goes back, which is the equivalent to saying the maximum growth rate is the profit rate. Well, in my dissertation, I had also read uh, uh, Marx for my dissertation, and the schemes of reproduction in Marx, you'll notice, have a different potential growth rates. Once you formalize that, you can easily see that the maximum growth rate is when all surplus value goes back. And that, I knew from having studied other things in, in graduate school, was that there's a von Neumann ray. So von Neumann, Marx, and Ricardo had another theory of the limits to growth. And it took me no more than 25 years to put it together into a theory of inflation. Because all these different elements had to be sorted out. By that time, I'd already figured this part out, but I ran into another problem. So by the 1980s, it was already seemed to me that the first answer was that inflation will be correlated with the tightness of the economy, and the tightness is this growth utilization rate. So 
the two variables should move well together. And I, I think I wrote an article somewhere in the late 80s or early 90s or something. So my part of the graph was up to here, not this part. I hadn't, didn't have the data yet. And it looked pretty good. But then as I ran the inflation seminar, it also became clear to me that that wouldn't work for countries like Argentina, wouldn't work for the hyperinflation cases and so on, because it wasn't just the tightness of the economy. There was something else. And that something else was the pull. And that led me to realize that there was all along in the classical tradition, and in fact in other traditions, the idea of pull and resistance. The pull comes from the creation of new purchasing power. And almost everybody says that leads to growth of nominal output, uh, on average. And the resistance comes from some inability to grow. And we, we have three candidates. The, Lack of availability of labor, so that's the unemployment rate. The lack of availability of capacity, the so capacity utilization rate. And the one variable that nobody seems to have noticed for 100 years or so, which is the growth utilization rate. And when I realized that, I realized that there was this explanation which was sensible, that makes sense of the data, and that also explained why, even though here these two move together very well, here the inflation rate is lower than the growth utilization rate. So what was going on there? And that led me to propose what I propose here, which is this push-pull model. Push, or rather, pull resistance model. And then, of course, having been early trained as an engineer, I know that a pull on something generates resistance, a resistance typically nonlinear. So you have to keep in your mind that a spring will expand fairly linearly in, when you pull on it. But as it gets tighter in its ability to pull, then that uh, reaction becomes highly nonlinear. At some point, it won't expand at all. This reached its limit. Okay? So all of these elements were there all along. And they arose out of asking a simple question. You know, and I always use the data for that question. Uh, that's why I show so many graphs here. I mean, I could do regression after regression. You won't see anything. The main point is you look at the data and it asks you a question. Why do these two not move together here and why do they move together here? Why do they not move together in World War, in uh, Korean War? Those kinds of questions require you to, to think in b b broader than dummy variables. And my interest always was generality. So uh, Alberto's dissertation took on I know, 24 countries or what, no, 10, 12 countries, whatever I said, a large number of countries. Um, uh, Bhargavi's dissertation, Ramamurthy's dissertation was 24 countries. And each time learning and refining the implications of what was a basic hypothesis for quite some time, a long period of time. So after some 20 years, I could feel comfortable writing it up and relating it to other things. I work very slowly, unfortunately. OK, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, has there been a, any, like a response to any question asked? No. I once talked to Robert Solo about this. Uh, and I said, you know, he was writing a book. Uh, he was uh, editing a book. And he said, do you know anybody who has any explanation of inflation? I said, oh, me. But he didn't want to hear that. Uh, when I explained it to him, he didn't make any sense. For him, the von Neumann ray was a balanced growth path with everything perfect and you can have a traverse from one to the other. So the idea that it could be a limit, and I, to be honest, I didn't send it to him either because I didn't think he would pick it up. Uh, so it, that was at least 10 or 15 years before it came out here. I published it in, the end, in, in a book, as a book essay. But uh, in the seminar, a lot of people did papers on it for different countries, Sweden, France, Germany, Italy. And uh, you could see this kind of curve that I was talking about, the, uh, um, the throop, what at that point I call the throughput curve. We would typically compare for a country the relationship between inflation on the vertical axis and uh, 1 minus sigma on the horizontal axis, and then compare the same uh, inflation data with the unemployment rate, which is the equivalent logical term in the Keynesian. And you, and you always found the unemployment rate 
the Phillips curve thing didn't work, and this was a kind of classical Phillips curve. And you know, there's really nothing in the theory, I think, even in, well, I don't think, uh, I don't know if Keynes would have understood this because the idea of growth in the physical economy wouldn't have, but Srafa would surely have understood this. It's a natural dual to Srafa's treatment of prices and production. And many Srafians did, in fact, build growth models from the dual of Srafa's prices. So the literature was always there. It just wasn't put together for this question. That's partly because much of the work in the Srafian and in the neoclassical tradition was about balanced growth and optimal paths and traverses and not really about the empirical phenomena. And the theory was constructed in such a way that they really, looking at data was vulgar. You didn't really, as I say, I come from an engineering background. For me, not looking at data is vulgar. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. You? Uh, I'm sort of grappling with this idea of there being a, a limit to, to the growth. So I understand that the, that the rate of profit gives you a, a sense of the, the global surplus value that is available and that is capable of being invested productively. And uh, that if you add uh, beyond that limit or as you approach that limit, uh, that purchasing power goes into inflationary processes. What happens if you think of endogenous or as of credit or other kinds of endogenous money? that could possibly be directed to the creation of new surplus value, which is not currently available, but which could go into productive processes before it is uh, realized as surplus value. And would that not uh, possibility the, the growth or the expansion uh, by the introduction of new purchasing power, even as you approach the, this, uh, this limit? Yes, but think of it differently. Suppose I ask you the question, Suppose that we just consider abstractly different rates of growth uh, in a balanced growth path. Then, leaving aside the question whether the money is there to call that, then you can quickly see that there is a limit to the balanced rate of growth, and that's the rate of growth uh, of the, uh, which, and that is the profit rate. And that kind of argument comes from von Neumann. The maximum balance rate of growth is when all of the surplus, physical surplus, is going in the absolutely proper proportions into every sector. Now, Passanetti, in a section which I cite in my book, makes a very interesting point. Suppose growth rates are different as they are normally. Then, as the economy's average growth rate gets higher, the difference in the growth rates has to be smaller because you start to hit bottlenecks. And those bottlenecks will limit the growth of everyone else. And the maximum growth rate is actually the lowest growth rate that is feasible from individual sectors because it's going to be the bottleneck that dominates everything. So the range of feasible growth rates in the average becomes smaller as the average gets bigger, and it approaches what is called, what Prashanti shows is a, is a physical limit to each sector's growth using uh, vertically integrated sectors or subsystems as uh, another way to do that. So that's a very interesting argument because that says that we'd expect bottlenecks to pop up more the higher the growth rate. And that hasn't been investigated as far as I know, but it could be. That's why I showed the data on growth rates earlier, uh, uh, I think last lecture, uh, on the U.S. economy itself. You can see that the growth rates don't run away from each other. They stay, whoops, I didn't realize I run over. My apologies, I'll stop right now. They run over, they, uh, they stay within some these are growth rates of the U.S. economy in different industries over 1987 to 2010. That's all that we have data for. And you can see the dark line is the average growth rate and the individual lines are the growth rates of different sectors. And this is two different sets of sectors. You can see they're quite different. But what's quite striking is that, you know, at the first level they seem to also cycle around some common element. And analytically you can show that you cannot grow faster for any sustained period than the maximum growth rate. And this problem came up not theoretically, it came up practically in the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union was struggling to put its economy together and gear up for a war, they had plenty of people, so there was no limit there. They had plenty of people to use. The problem was, how fast could they grow? Well, no industry could go faster than its inputs. But the inputs depend on the inputs of some other industry and using input output tables, which they invented. 
they're able to show that the maximum practical growth rate came from the structure of production. Even if you had the demand to, and they could create the demand for it, because they'd order it. So that's the important point. So the pull is the effective demand part, but the limit is the physical growth rate. Anyway, next time we begin chapter 16, which is putting all of these elements together. All of them, I remind you, are derived from some very small basic set of principles. No ad hocery as you go along. We're going to use that to explain the current crisis, beginning, uh, ending with 2000, uh, and beginning in 2007. It's not mine. Thank you. Okay, thank you.